Good morning, everyone. Let's stand and raise our voices together. Praise Jesus. We are so thankful to have you in worship with us this morning. I wanted to start with a scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the wisdom literature that we get from King Solomon. And these are the last two verses, and it, it's an amazing reminder. This is what he says. He says, this is the end of the matter, for all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commands, for that is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We are here because that God has called us to be the church in amazing ways, to live for the good that we have, and to be the people of Christ. We're so glad that you're here with us today. You may be seated. Well, thanks, Pastor Mike. We wanted to start off just kind of getting into it. I don't know about you all, but the cool weather just... Just makes me want to snuggle up and curl in. And uh, so thank you all for joining us for worship today. We're, we're excited. We got a great service planned. Lots and lots going on here at the church. Um, we uh, want to begin with a few announcements here. First, as always, if you're a guest with us, first time joining us, especially, we'd love for you to text welcome to 308 730 4040, um, and that's a great way to connect with us. We also have the connect cards in the pews. Um, for those of you joining us online, use that messenger button if you'd like um, to message us and connect in that way. However we can serve you, that's what that is there for. Um, admittedly, last night we were going over uh, prayers. I was making the prayer announcement, and I, I forgot what I asked you all to pray for last week. Because, um, I, I mean, I've been praying for it, but I was just not in the right headspace, you know, Saturday night doing projects and then coming back. It's like, wait, we were praying for something. What was it? Um, it and it was for my father-in-law. And so I thank you all for praying for him. He's doing much better. Um, he overdid it a little bit this week, but that's on him, you know, so... Uh, it's it's kind of like that prayer request of, you know, hey, God, please let me get that 10-point buck this fall. Like, okay, there's kids starving in Africa. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm going to pray for. No, I'm teasing. All right, got on a sidetrack there. If we can pray for you, uh, let us know. Uh, similarly, all those ways that we shared to connect with us, that's a great way to share your prayer requests. Okay, lots and lots coming up here at the church. It, it uh, is midsummer, but you wouldn't know it by how much is going on around here. Next week, Sunday, one week from today, we are going to begin our Vacation Bible School. We're really excited, um, hoping to have tons and tons of kids here. So as always, um, invite the kids, you know, and get them registered. If you have supplies that you've uh, suggested you're going to donate with the cards, bring those back. 
Um, similarly, there's a Walmart list going around. That'll be on the, on the Monday news email. If you want to purchase that directly, uh, use that link. That'll be really easy. But uh, just get all the kids here and pray for God to move in those children. Uh, next up, we have baptism at the lake scheduled, and we have one or two families, but we like to have three or four just to, uh, just to make it a full-out celebration. So if you or somebody you know is interested in baptism, uh, we'd love to have that conversation with them and do baptism out at the lake. So uh, we're really looking for some to sign up, otherwise we're, and it's not just Otherwise, we're going to baptize them in worship, you know, uh, with you all. But we want plenty of the body around. And that's one of the beliefs that we practice about baptism is we don't do individual private baptism. It is a profession of faith. And so we do that together. So that's why we want to build a crowd up um, and get a few more folks around so that we can honor uh, that sacrament as well. All right, next up, we have a men's breakfast. And that's two weeks away, um, 8 a.m., come for breakfast and a pretty decent conversation. Um, I don't think we're going to talk too much about politics. I, I hear one side gets a little sleepy when that happens, so um, <laughs> I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. It doesn't matter. Um, anyway, that's men's breakfast. Hope you can join us that Saturday. And then lastly, next week, we begin a new message series. I know this excuses series, Our Big Butt, has been a little weird, but I'm going to turn your attention to the screen. So that's a little bit of a preview. We've been going through the letters to the church, Dear Church, and our Bible reading challenge, and now we're going to go all in, um, including our message series, to go over this and just talk about what does it mean to be the church and, uh, and how we're wrestling with things. That's one of the things I love about Paul's writings is how we wrestle with all sorts of, all sorts of things, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, how we be the church, how we be on mission together. So we're really excited for it. That's next week, though. Today we are here to worship. We've got a few more songs. You all were singing really good earlier. So uh, let's keep that up. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able. Let's continue. thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. With open arms, see for God. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking. So love, God so loved the world. 
God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Sing it again. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. Praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him. For God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Does he see me in my troubles? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able. Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? But when I look back, did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did. So yes, he Those voices try to tell me I'm forgotten and fallen too far from his hands. But I know what kind of God he is, and I'm trusting in his promises. I'm believing and I'm singing. Yes, he cares. Oh, did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did. So, yes, he children forward for our children's moment.
All right, I'm gonna read a Bible verse. So pay a lot of attention. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. All right, so this verse is, the first part is a little funny to understand. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So do you guys remember that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins, right? Yes. So this verse is telling us that when we come to know Jesus, um, he starts living inside of us. So I know that sounds kind of funny. So I'm going to try to explain it in a different way. So here's, what is it? Just a glove, right? All right. And it has the shape of a hand, right? Can it do anything? No. But it looks like a hand. Okay, now let's try something else. Can he do something now? Yeah? yeah? What? Can he lift something up? Yeah. Yeah. It can? By itself? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a balloon? Yeah. It really can't do anything. I mean, it looks like he could do something, but he can't. There's nothing to hold anything inside. What about if, like Levi said, I put my hand inside? This is a small glove. <laughs> That's fine. I have a small hand, so. What about now? Yeah. It, can, it can do a lot of things, right? I can say hi to people. I can probably lift things up. Ooh, I, now this glove can do a lot of things, but hold on. Is it the glove or is it the hand inside the glove? It's the hand that's inside the glove that makes the glove be able to do a lot of things. The same way is with us, all right? So we need the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus in our life in order to do a lot of things or the things he wants us to do. But sometimes in order to do the things he wants us to do, we have to say no to some things we want to do. And I know that's very hard things or complicated things to understand right now. But all you need to know is that we're the glove and the Holy Spirit is the hand. And because of the Holy Spirit, we can do a lot of things. And we can lift others and we can be very strong in Christ. But it's because of the hand, not the glove. All right. I hope that wasn't too hard. Did you guys get it? Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of your blessings. And thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us and gives us the strength, the patience, the love. It gives us everything we need in order to live a life that is pleased pleasing to you and that is full. Thank you, Lord. Help us shine our light and love others the way you would. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So I'll have myself give you some suckers. <laughs> Oh, good brother-sister interaction there. That's really good. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, uh, our God sighting takes a little bit different of a twist. And one of the things, after thinking about it a little bit, I wanted to begin with this scripture. Uh, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. That's Psalm 118, 1. Um, I remember an old, I think it was a 90s song. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Got a nice little 
And of all things, his love endures forever. Anyway, it's a good little song. Um, that scripture, that song comes to my mind often. Um, and, and I think for a lot of us in the church, when we look to Jesus, we can all be intimidated by his goodness. Like, he handled everything perfectly. And sometimes as Christians, I think we, we put it on ourselves. Well, if I'm a Christian, I should handle everything perfectly. And, and while the world is like, um, you should never, like the world is afraid of humiliation. And so then that just pushes that drive even more to never make a mistake and, and that kind of thing. And that's just, I think that's too much pressure for us. Um, what I think instead we're called to be is good stewards. And that's really important. Good stewards don't do everything perfectly. They just do the best with what they have. And as, as we think about that, about being good stewards, um, one of the things I'm mindful of is during the summer, project season is in full swing. And, and that may be for you at home. Maybe you're doing home projects or, or going through some things, or maybe your project is just to make it to fall when school starts, uh, whatever it is. Um, here at the church, too, we have projects. For instance, Vacation Bible School. It, there are a lot of projects that lead up to making this one week happen. Um, but one of the things that we were looking at it's been several years since we've really taken a look at our website and asked, is this doing what we need it to do for our ministry? And the whole view of, and, and we're giving it away here, the whole view of a website is that it can do ministry outside of Sunday morning. So all 168 hours of your week, the website is there to listen to a message. Uh, you know, our whole archive going back almost 10 years is there. There's probably a message there for you. Um, there's ways to pray. There's ways to engage. Um, we keep an up-to-date calendar on there. So um, it's really good, and we've decided it was time to update it. But as we were looking, um, and I'll, I'll get to the point here, um, we discovered that there's something funny going on with giving. And we have all just kind of accepted whenever we do something online that there's going to be some sort of transaction fee. I mean, I just went to the snow cone shop and they said, well, it's going to be an extra 50 cents because we got to cover the transaction fee. Um, and, and that's why a lot of you choose to give through check or cash. I really appreciate that. That's great. But several of us do give online. And so when we do that, we incur a three and a half as up, up well, it starts at three and a half, but it goes up to 5% fee. So that's quite a bit and turns into thousands of dollars throughout the entire year. Well, what we found is we found a new company that allows us to be even better stewards. Um, they only charge a flat 1.9%, and on ACH, instead of a percentage, it's just a single quarter. Um, and so in the coming weeks and months, we're going to be sharing on how you can switch to giving online um, or just switch over your giving if you're on, already giving online, not to assume anything, not to assume your generosity, but just to say, we're striving to be better stewards as well and everything. And, and not that we necessarily got it wrong on the website before, but we took a hard look and said, wow, we can do this even better. And so um, that's the leadership that we strive to share is how can we continue to do this better and better? And that's one of the ways we're doing it. So with that comes a cool little announcement, not the offering one. That one's not cool. That one's the one we have to say every week, right? <laughs> Okay? And not the guilt trip for money. We, just, we hope you always give out of a sense of generosity. But with this transition season, we get to do something exciting. Um, this company that we're partnering with that will handle our giving and our website, um, they're actually going to revamp our whole website for free, which includes a professional photographer coming out in two weeks. So we're really excited. Um, that means you all just show up in your Sunday best like you are right now. I love it. Y'all look good, so don't worry about that. Don't do extra makeup or go all out. Uh, but just be sure to be here and show up with the love of Christ that you share every Sunday when we worship. And we're going to capture what it means to be First Church. It means to be a good steward. It means to worship faithfully among so many other things. And, and so we're really excited. A little bit of an announcement, a little bit of a we're trying to be good stewards, and that's what we invite you to do as well. Take a quick inventory. How can you be the best steward possible? Not perfect, but good. 
and uh, we'll continue to work toward that progress. So if you'd like to give today, I invite you to give um, online, give through the offering plate, doesn't matter how, just ask that you have that sincerity in your heart to draw closer to him, for his goodness reigns forever. Amen? Amen. We've got one more song. It's kind of based around this Psalm 118. Um, so I'll invite you to stand, and we'll continue in worship. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. Sing it again. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. continue in our worship now with a word from God. Scott has our scripture lesson. We're out of the book of James. Amen. Our scripture today comes from James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. 
What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to take a second to greet one another, but I have a phrase I want to, you to say to one another, okay? It's one that we're going to talk about. It's really deep. It's one that I feel deep down in my soul sometimes. I don't want to. All right? Let's greet one another. Say, but I don't want to. Do you want to? All right. Let's greet. Yeah. I'll get you one. And those of you joining us online, as always, we are grateful for you and your presence in this way. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you uh, couldn't make it. Maybe you're from an entirely different zip code or watching someplace else. That's okay. Um, we as First Church are an online ministry as well and want to connect with you however we can. So if we can pray for you or something like that, let us know. Interact in those comment sections. And uh, just like we're here, it makes uh, the worship service that much more powerful for you at home. Um, and again, if it's private, that's what that message buttons for. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Let us know how we can serve you. God bless. Well, we're so glad to have everyone in worship with us today. I'll, I'll wait for you, Renee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. So there was a, a plaque hanging in our kitchen when I was growing up, and it, it, it hung there for years, just a simple little plastic decor piece that said this, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may diet. Oh. <laughs> of course, the key is, as long as you read it every morning, it's always today and never tomorrow, so the diet just keeps getting pushed off, right? I may have taken that too seriously. But the point isn't about the diet. It, it's really that we can put things off in different ways. And there's lots of different ways that we push things off, phrases that get to that same idea. Like if you're a cartoon fan, maybe you get your mantra from SpongeBob. Squidward says it this way, why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? See, most of us don't like to admit it, but sometimes we're procrastinators. There are these things that we know are tasks we should do, and we find reasons to put it off. As Micah mentioned, today we're wrapping up our sermon series that's titled Our Big Butt. <laughs> yeah, we have to say goodbye to our friendly cow. Of course, behind the concept of all of this series is that we have excuses that often hold us back. And, and we're not just talking about with our diet or with those chores that we don't like to do. Too often, we find excuses that hold us back in our faith walk. So far, we've, we've looked at some of those common excuses like, but I can't, or but it's hard, or but I'm scared. And today, we'll tackle what I think may be the, the most honest and yet the hardest excuse of all. But I don't want to. Now, maybe you're thinking, what does today's scripture have to do with this? And, and I promise we'll get there. But I do think that there's some background that may help set the stage. Today's reading comes from one of those little letters, epistles, this one written by James. And it is one of my favorite epistles. It's a book all about the action of Christianity. Now, some scholars think that this was written by Jesus' own brother named James. Others think that it was one of the two disciples named James. James the Lesser and James the Greater. Clearly, James was a very popular name at the time. But whoever the author is, this, this little five-chapter book is filled with practical life application activities for our Christian life. Only you'll notice, if you read it, that the author doesn't really pull any punches. He's usually pretty blunt. 
James 2.17 has that famous saying we hear, faith without works is dead. At times, James calls the audience of his letter liars, hypocrites, and adulterers. If you're looking for a book filled with encouragement, a, a big pat on the back for being a Christian, this really isn't the book. Although James did inspire some fascinating pieces of literature, like the song Pass It On, It Only Takes a Spark to Get a Fire Going, a quote from James. The thing is, this book, it, it wasn't always very well accepted. And sometimes we forget that the Bible didn't just show up one day complete and filled. Like our Old Testament, we we always look at it and go, it is the, the scriptures that came from our Jewish roots. And yet what we have in our Old Testament is just a portion of what the Jewish culture today uses as their religious texts. Then we look at the books of the New Testament. They're really just a handful of the writings that were written during the first century. Actually, it was almost 200 years after Jesus' resurrection before the church settled on what they would call the canon, what were the essential books of the Bible that we would put in the New Testament. And it was 367 AD before all 27 books appeared in one single collection. James was the very last book to be included. Now, some people look at it and say that that may be a strike against it, like it was right on the cutoff, and I think it's just the opposite. I think it reminds us just how important this book is. See, the early church, it it had lots of questions, not just about what to believe, but what to do. How were we called to live as Christians? And I think the church today still wrestles with some of those same questions. And in today's reading, James is still kind of blunt. In verse 14, he tells the audience, For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Really inspires you, doesn't it? I mean, When Paul writes, he says, I give thanks for you always. When James writes, he says, you're just a vapor. And yet I think, I think James is always so misunderstood. And today's scripture is one that I think is misunderstood often. See, people will misinterpret what was written today as this statement that we shouldn't make plans. Just, life is too short, you never know what to expect, so just live for today. I have seen far too many Christians that take this scripture and think it's like the biblical equivalent of YOLO. You only live once. Now, if you want to sound cool, I guess you're not supposed to use that statement anymore. I read an article this week that that said uh, this was the number one term that Gen Z said made you sound old, is YOLO, which tells me two things, that there are people out there who will research anything, and I spend way too much time on the internet. (laughs) I guess the new cool acronym you're supposed to use when texting is D-I-F-T-P, do it for the plot. I didn't get it. I had to ask my 18-year-old son. Of course, we talk about YOLO, you only live once. And before that was FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. Or if you want to go really old school, there's the Latin saying we used to use called carpe diem, seize the day. You notice the terminology has changed time and time again, but the concept was always the same. For centuries, our our world has, has been relabeling and repackaging the same old lie. Live for today. Do what makes you happy. Worry about number one. See, at the heart of of all of those is really this excuse that we're talking about today, but I don't want to. 
Anytime something comes up that doesn't sound fun or exciting, we convince ourselves it's okay to just skip it. I don't want to becomes the only excuse you really need. But that's never what God intended. Now, there are situations where I think we say that excuse, but, but it doesn't really hold us back. Like, I don't know about you, but I am not a big morning person, okay? And so I will lay in bed a lot of mornings and go, but I don't want to. And still I get out of bed and I do the things I need to. My wife has discovered that she kind of likes running, which I still don't get, but she does, right? She says that she feels so much better after she's done. And yet it is not an uncommon thing before she walks out the door for her run to go, but I don't want to. And then she does it, and she feels better. I'm guessing you can all think of examples in your own life, things that you don't really want to do, but you find yourself doing anyway. The thing is, when it, when it comes to our faith, sometimes the excuses went out. We know better, like we know that worshiping regularly is good for us. We, we know that if we read our Bible more often, it would be beneficial. We know that when life is stressful, one of the best things we can do is pray. We know that serving other people makes a difference. We know it, but we don't always do it. And if we're honest, part of the rationale is but I don't want to. There's a, there's a new phrase that's gaining momentum in Christian circles called practical atheists. Now, it's not targeted as people who don't believe in God. It's about those who often live their life like God doesn't exist. Maybe that sounds unfair, and yet... At the core of it is this reality that we live in a country where 86% of Americans claim to be Christians, and yet the way we live doesn't look any different than the non-Christians. Statistically, when you look, the number of Christians who give generously is the same as people who are non-Christians. When you look at statistics like divorce or pornography use, there, there is virtually no difference between the Christian population and the non-Christian population. Now, there is one exception. People who attend worship regularly have much different statistics. But podcaster John Stone Street asked this question. He says, if a time traveler from the early church were to secretly follow you from Monday through Saturday evening, would they be able to tell you were a Christian? Now, we might be quick to defend ourselves and say, well, well, I prayed before the meals, most meals anyway, and, and I did my devotion several times this week, so sure, they would know that I'm a Christian, and yet, if we try to justify it away, then we miss the challenge in this question. See, God, God never intended our lives to be separated. God never looked at our lives and said, this is your spiritual life and this is your secular life. Our world, our lives were not meant to be split into those categories. And yet, there are so many places where we find ourselves doing it. Like, we'll get really busy with a project at work, and, and all of a sudden we feel like we've neglected our family. Or we'll decide, I want to be a good parent, and, and so I'm going to help my kids do any and every activity they want to, and, and then it starts to feel like I'm neglecting my spouse. When you add the spiritual aspects, it even gets more challenging. Like, I know I should go to Bible study, but that means 90 minutes that I miss out with my family. Or I know I should do my devotions this morning, but then I don't get to sit at the table with my kids for breakfast. We see all of these different pieces, and we start to live a life that, that starts to feel like, well, if I want to be successful in this area, I have to neglect this area. 
You remember what our biggest but of all is? <laughs> but I don't have enough time. See, that's the dilemma that James was wrestling with in today's text. When our scripture begins in, in chapters 13 and 14, it says this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow I will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow may bring. See, too often, Christians have looked at this and gone, let's just take the YOLO approach. What, what James must be saying is, let's not make big plans. Let's just live in the moment. Only that doesn't, that doesn't fit with what God tells us elsewhere in Scripture. Like Proverbs 21.5, again, written by King Solomon, the wisest man ever. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to want. See, the problem, the struggle that, that James was trying to deal with in today's text, it wasn't that people were making plans and shouldn't be. It's that they left God out of the equation. They were so focused on success, they forgot about the Savior. Looking at our world, I wonder if sometimes we do the same. Author and pastor Rick Wilcox says it this way, our goal is independence and self-reliance, the essence of the great American dream. Only in this worldview, God is an accessory to our plans, and his main job is to grant our requests and make our dreams come true. Now, I'm guessing none of us would say that we call God an accessory, but sometimes we live that way. When it comes to our faith... <laughs> We too often say, I don't want to. And so we don't. Don't mishear me. Yes, we all make mistakes. Yes, we all fall short. Yes, we all get tired. I know that there are days we feel like we are overwhelmed. I know there are days that we just run out of time. And yes, God's grace is sufficient to cover every one of those. And yet the thing is, God, God doesn't encourage us to worship or to tithe or to pray or to serve because he wants us to be obedient. He wants us to be better. He wants us to help make the world better. And sometimes our butts get in the way. Let me give one more example. If I ask all of you why you chose the career you're in, I'm guessing every one of us could come up with some reasons why this was the choice we made. This is the reason why. And yet I'm guessing I could also ask you if there are tasks you have to do in your job that you don't like, and every one of us is going to say yes, things we don't want to do. But we do them because we see the bigger picture, the importance in the overall part of our job. The question is, do we do the same with our faith? I love the way that one of my favorite writers, author and pastor James Howell, puts it. He said, when we graduated seminary, I do not recall thinking, I want to go to meetings, or I want to make budgets, or even I want to preach. Way back then, I just really felt an intense love for Jesus and wondered if he had any errands I might run for him. Oh, how I live for that same kind of faith. recognize and 
to remember the excitement when I first gave my life to Christ. I don't remember getting a call to ministry and saying, you know what I'd really like to do is, is do a lot of interviews and hire staff for a preschool. <laughs> I just wanted to serve this Jesus. However he called me. Church, <laughs> there are so many more excuses we could talk about. <laughs> So many things that get in the way of our faith. And this series, it, it is not to point fingers or to make people feel guilty. It's that God, God wants the best for us. And we do too. See, maybe one of these excuses that we talked about really clicked for you during this series. Or maybe one of these topics, you, you look at a friend or family member and go, they're struggling with a big butt. Don't tell them that. It may not go well. And yet, I hope and pray that this series is so much more than a series. I hope it's a way that God calls you to a fuller life. Church, what is God calling you to? Where are the places you can grow and serve and share in amazing ways? I know the answer will not be the same for all of us. But trust me, God has some errands that he'd like you to run. And they are always, always worth it in the end. Amen? Amen? Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we thank you once again for all the ways that you have shown up in our lives. All the ways you challenge us to be better, to make the world better as well. Lord, in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of all the different directions we feel pulled, sometimes there are excuses that come up. And they may, they may feel very legitimate. They may be legitimate in the moment. And still, you have something better in store for us. We ask you, God, to, to help us push aside all of the excuses to serve you fully. Not because God, not, not because we have to, not because you make us, not because it's required to get into heaven, but because it's how we look more like you. It's how we honor you for all that you have done. It's how we return the love that you have given us. So Lord, as we gather today once again to, to share in this incredible gift of communion, we ask you to pour out once again your Holy Spirit on all of us that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ in a, in a crazy and amazing way. We ask you, God, to to help empower us so that, that we can take your Holy Spirit and become the body of Christ in the world, redeemed by your great love. By your Spirit, God, we, we ask you to make us one with Christ and one with each other in ministry to the whole world until we all get to feast at your heavenly banquet. We ask all of this, God, through the, the name of your Son, Jesus, who with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, we give all honor and glory to you, Almighty God. Amen. Well, church, we are here because of what Christ has done. Because despite how hard it was, despite the pain that came with it, 
He never let any excuses get in the way. We're here because on the night he gave himself up for us, Jesus gathered with his friends and took bread, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And after the meal, Jesus took a cup and gave thanks to God for all who would come before, all who would come after, and said, this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We come to this meal not, not because we are saved by the action, but because it reminds us how we can be more like Christ. Today, is, as you get the chance to celebrate this incredible meal, I hope and pray that it, it's not just a chance to ask for forgiveness, it's a chance to be empowered, to push past the excuses, and to fully live your life for Christ. Pastor Mike, as we continue in our worship now, we have an opportunity to receive communion. And for each of us, that may mean something a little bit different, but it is still the same God offering incredible forgiveness. And so with that, I invite you to come, experience his love, and the way we'll do that today, uh, for those of you online, just join us in a spirit of prayer. Uh, but for those of us here, I invite you to make your way around either side of the sanctuary, and uh, there you'll find the table uh, with bread and juice. Take a piece of bread out of the basket and dip it lightly in the cup remembering the sacrifice and love of Jesus for you. You're welcome then to kneel. You're welcome to pray. You're welcome to sing along at any point here. Um, but most importantly, you're welcome to this table. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church in order to receive. We just ask that you have that desire in your heart to maybe quit making a few excuses today and draw closer. So with that, the table is set. Let us continue in our worship. Our hope. 
the cross it has spoken death is no more Christ is the Lord oh, this is our incredible reminder. What a great challenge as we go from this time and place of worship. As we go out into the world, let us remember that every task God calls us to may not be exciting or easy, but it's worth it. Go into the world running these incredible errands for Christ, knowing that we, we can be better and make our world better because Christ is in us. Thanks for worshiping today.